Well, Shabbat Shalom. As one of my most beloved friends and teachers, Rabbi Mordechai Finley has always inculcated his students with, he would say, Chevra, remember that the Bible is not journalism, it's literature. And as an English major, that's always struck me very close to the heart. This is literature. It is sacred, it is mythical, it is legal, it is spiritual, historically based, evolutionary, sociological, idealistic, and realistic literature. And in literature, we look for themes, motifs that give color and meaning to the texts, that tie the action together with ideas that say, look at me, I'm here to imprint something on your very soul. There are so many themes in Genesis, too many to list here today. And Vayetze, this particular parsha, has more themes than we could shake a proverbial stick at. Much has been said about them. The theme of angels, of dreams, of the repetition of irony and measure for measure, the theme of trickery and conniving, the theme of cunning, and the theme of not even being able to trust family. But there is a recurring character in this Parsha, that hearing this story again now in this time, I cannot ignore. It is a silent character, but a powerful one indeed. This is the character of the stone. Over and over again in this Parsha, more than almost any other place that I could think of or find at all, we have the appearance of stones. Stones at the beginning, stones in the middle, stones at the end, stones even in the Haftarah. You may have noticed that as Rabbi Rubin finished his beautiful reading, the final line of Hosea for this week's Haftarah, one of the choices in chapter 12, verse 12, is, for Gilead it is worthless, no purpose have they been sacrificing oxen in Gilgal. The altars of these are like stone heaps upon a plowed field. But that's just kind of the final icing on the cake to the appearance of stones again and again in Parshat Vayetze. In chapter 28, verse 11, we find Jacob coming upon a place. He alights on a special place and he spends the night there. That's way back at the beginning of the Parsha. He takes one of the stones, an evan, a stone of the place, put it under his head as a pillow and lay down in that place. And when he woke up from his extraordinary dream of what became known as Jacob's Ladder, with angels going up and down on it, and God standing beside it, giving a magnificent prognostication and prophecy about the fate of the children of who will be called Israel. When Jacob wakes up, he takes that stone and he sets it up as a pillar, and he pours oil over the top of it. That stone becomes a consecrated place. And as he goes along in his journey, chapter 29, all the way from verse 1 through number 10, over and over again, we read about this stone that sits on the well of the water around which the flocks of the area were sitting and waiting to be gathered and so they could be fed. And the stone, the Torah tells us, on the mouth of the well was large. Jacob inquires about the stone, they gather, and while he is speaking to the shepherds, along comes Rachel, the daughter of his uncle Laban, his intended, as we soon discover. And with this surge of adrenaline, Jacob goes up and removes the stone off the mouth of the well. He literally rolls it away. Vayagel et ha'even. It's written with letters to suggest that he also revealed something as well. There's uh, the same root, vayagel, to roll away and also to reveal something. So this time, he doesn't take a stone, he removes a stone. And you may have noticed at the end in the section that Rabbi Ruman was chanting for us today, we have a pact set up around a pile of stones. Jacob himself takes a stone. In chapter 31, verse 45, he takes a stone again and sets it up as a pillar. And Jacob said to his kinsmen, because that wasn't enough, gather stones. So they took stones and made a mound, and they partook of a meal there by the mound. And this mound of stone becomes a witness. Jacob names it Galaed, similar, of course, to Gilead, from where we get the name. This pile of stones becomes a witness for a pact between Jacob and Laban after all of the years of bad blood and conceit and contrivance. That can't be an accident. 
our biblical authors were not so unimaginative that they just kept using the motif of the stone. In fact, our biblical author is brilliant indeed. Fleeing his brother's rage and despair, Jacob anchors into one of the most indelible God revelations with that night vision of Jacob's ladder, using that stone for a pillar. When he sees what he wants, with superhero strength, he rolls away the stone from atop the well. And after strife, servitude, trickery, anger, rupture, accusations, and outright wickedness, peace is established by gathering that mound of stones. This most complex of our forefathers seems to intuit to the letter the teaching of a sage that we call Kohelet, Ecclesiastes. In his chapter 3, verse 1 through 8, description of a season being set for everything and a time for every experience under heaven. Kohelet reminds us, among so many other things for which there is a time, there is, verse 5, eight lehashlich avanim, the eight kenos avanim. There is a time for tossing stones and a time for gathering stones. Now, it's not the clearest of references, and commentators have had a wonderful time trying to figure out what Kohelet meant by that. What does it mean to toss stones and to gather them? Some are a little bit of a blue interpretations of that, having something to do with procreating, and others see in it a relationship to the verse before, a time for tearing down and a time for building up in verse 3. But Jacob, quite literally, gathers stones when he needs them and tosses them aside when he doesn't. Jacob is often described as shrewd and cunning, and I've heard that said as high praise and also as a, very much a disparagement. But he seems to adjust to the circumstances and conditions in which he finds himself, despite or probably because of the hardship and disruption that he had experienced. He seems to possess an uncanny ability to know when it's time to gather a stone and when it is time to throw one aside. Rashi suggests that Kohelet's reference to dispersing the stones, a time for scattering stones or tossing them even, is meant to be a comfort to those of us who have lived in exile, who have been isolated and cut off from everything we've known, felt like a, a rolling stone looking for a place to settle down. And that this message of Kohelet has been heard throughout the centuries as a reminder that there are times when we are scattered, when we are not cohesive. And that's okay, because in the next phrase, we are given hope, says Rashi, that there will in fact be a time when our scattered stones are brought back together. It is Ibn Ezra who suggests that it is a comfort both ways, a reminder that there is in fact time to break down the old, to leave behind what had once been and ultimately regroup into something new. Jacob makes so many mistakes, and gosh, does he pay for them over and over again. But he is Israel, or will be soon, and we are his children because we see ourselves in him. Scattered like stones throughout history, the Jewish people has still somehow been able to gather itself more or less together for strength and connection to the divine and a holy dream, and in the hope that we might yet muster a monument to peaceful coexistence with our neighbors, family, brothers and sisters and cousins in disputed land. And when we have needed to, we have moved mountains, we have rolled stones off proverbial wells, unleashing the energy contained within us and within our precious universe so that we could find the spring of life and new possibility waiting within. And what about in this time, this time of pandemic and fear, during which time we have indeed been scattered, our plans and imaginings upended so that like Jacob, we have found ourselves on the run from so much of what we have known. And in these times, what have we clung to, the way Jacob clung to that stone of a pillow 
when he lay down and had one of the most extraordinary God revelations of anyone in our Torah. What have we done? What has been our stone, our Evan? What have we clung to? What have you grabbed onto to stay connected to the source of things in this bizarre and frightening time? And what has been cast aside like that stone heavy on the top of the well? What have we pushed aside from the old way of being as Jacob did? What have we been able to shed so that maybe something new could be born? What have we had to be flexible with to find superhuman strength to just roll it away and say, let's see what springs forth in this new and extraordinary time? Have we identified something that's been worth mustering our strength for, even if it's hard and elusive and takes a heck of a lot longer than anyone wished or planned? Just like Jacob had to defer his gratification, working years to marry the girl he loved, only to find out he would have to work another seven in order to fully cement his family. Delayed gratification is something that many of us have known during this time. And yet, as Jacob proved ultimately, though it was difficult and messy and involved some real pain along the way, some things are worth moving the stones for. And in the end, as we have by some miracle gathered our scatteredness on this day, can we ask, as Jacob and even Laban do at the end of this parsha, how have we grown and changed during this time? As both of those men did to varying degrees, they're still very human and very flawed, but how did they grow and change in those long intervening years? What new insights or accomplishments, understandings, wisdom have we accumulated and gathered in this time? that can be pulled together to a monument of our resilience and faith and hope in a future. These avanim, these stones of Parshat Vayetze, tell a story of their own, without words, but by bearing silent witness to a portrait of faith, courage, hope, and peace. May the lessons of these stones inspire us to continue our quest for the same. Shabbat Shalom.